Well, it's true in, uh, in Luke's Gospel. <laughs> it's a parable that you all know about the prodigal son. Um, Luke chapter 15, uh, verses uh, 11 to 24. The younger boy. If we were asked, uh, What's an educated person? I mean, very difficult question. You can really can name it very complicated, can't you? But the answer you gave them. But the simple answer would be the three R's. You know something about reading and writing and arithmetic. That's okay. And if you say, what, what's a Christian? What is a Christian? And then that can be very complicated too. You say, well, there are three R's there. And it's in this story. It's rebellion. Man's rebellion against God. And then there's uh, man's repentance for his sin. And then there's uh, man's reconciliation to God. The three arms. No, that's a skeleton, isn't it? And uh, uh, skeletons are useful. You can see where I'm going to go tonight. Going down those... Uh, three steps and taking you with me as we go through this passage but I, I'm not going to deal with uh, three three R's uh, by themselves um, I'm going to deal with this oral portrait of God's redemption the, the picture itself has its wonderful validity and finality the parable is more accurate and far more moving and even more profound than me tossing out three words like um, ruin and uh, repentance and reconciliation. The picture that he paints of this boy is so evocative and open-ended <coughs> and it's there. You, you know it. You all know it. And I... I said that uh, last Sunday when I preached this message in my home church and there was a, a, a man there and he'd never heard of the parable of the prodigal son. And he was in tears at, at the end of, of the message. So, um, oh, may it come freshly to all of us. May we be like the man who dug a hole to bury something and his blade hit a chest and when he dug it out to open the chest it was full of gold and silver and pearls may we find uh, this this great treasure i want this picture to live in you again for the rest of the week um, it's the picture of an old man running to meet a son that's been away far dissolute a long way from home that he was beginning to fear he would never see again and falling on his neck and kissing him and welcoming him and said, that, that was me that was me and so let's look firstly then uh, at this uh, the rebellion of the son there was a, a boy, a younger boy a farmer had two sons and he was a landowner and one day he went to his father and he said to him, give me the, the portion legally that's mine. I'm 18 now. It's time for me to have my portion. And uh, he was giving up his right to any more of his father's land. All that remained would belong to his older brother. When the father divided the property then between the two sons, the younger would turn his share into cash. And that must have meant that the land was evaluated and was divided into two. And he immediately sold the portion that was his to someone else. And the shame of that would fall upon the family. Adding to the shame that already was the son's for asking his father for his portion. <coughs> because normally... The son had been cared for all his life. And then, uh, as his father grew old and feeble, 
that uh, the boy would care for his father until he died. And uh, this request that the son made was really saying, I wish you were dead. That's what he was saying. Um, I have a friend in London and he's a pastor and he works with Muslims from uh, uh, Pakistan. And he told them this parable, they'd never heard it before. And he said to them, what would happen in your country if a boy asked his father to divide up the land and give him the portion and he was leaving home? And they said, the father would kill him. So you must understand something of the shock that this story brings out today as much as it did in Jesus' day. So we told the son got everything that he had and he turned flocks and land into cash. And off he went. He was leaving once for all. Nothing was left behind. He was not returning. Everything was taken. He had no pleasure in his father's home whatsoever. He wanted to put as many miles as possible between his home and himself. He found his old life suffocating, restricting, narrow, and he headed for a place very far from where he had been raised. He went to another country, a distant country, and so he chose the life of paganism over the privileges of living in the promised land. He turned his back on the covenant people of God. It's like somebody who was raised and nurtured in this church. And they've gone off. And they say, I've had it. I'm not going to meet with those people in any church ever again. He wanted no reminder of God. And uh, it's such an impossible step because you can't escape from God, can you? We were out in the Welsh countryside last uh, week, away from the city lights, and there was this canopy <coughs> of glory above us, a cloudless night and stars, and the Milky Way in all its beauty. We saw the sunset over Cardigan Bay, and the starlings coming in their shoals, in their murmurings, and landing under the pier where they roosted for the night. What a spectre it all was of the glory of the God who made it. You have a voice of conscience. You're all made in the image and likeness of God. And that's God's monitor inside you. It tells you when you speak to your parents disrespectfully and whinge and complain. It tells you you're doing wrong. And it commends you when you help. And when you're kind and patient and forgiving. It says, well done. Because you were made in God's image and, and likeness. <coughs> and you can't escape from God. Two o'clock in the morning he can wake you up and summon you to his bar. And speak to you. And you know that you're a sinner. So in that new country the boy went and made new friends. And spoke a new language and picked up new habits and dressed like the people did in that place. I finally got away, he said, from all that I hated so much. Nobody knows me here, I can go wherever I want, I can do whatever I want to do without anyone's frown or disapproval. He answered to no one and so he indulged in forbidden pleasures that he couldn't imagine while living in the narrow confines of the farm. It is not, you understand, it is not that now he was able to go to 18th birthday parties. It is not that. It is not that now he's able to go to weddings and to receptions afterwards. Every Christian can do that now. Our Lord Jesus went to weddings and he went to parties. So it is not that. It is not that at all. But this is unrestrained sensuality. 
spendthrift extravagance. That's what he indulged in. His motto was spend, spend, spend for tomorrow we might die. And so he gathered around him a host of hangers-on. Uh, every itch was scratched. Every appetite was satisfied. He deprived himself of no new sensation. He sowed to the flesh, thinking, Ha! Ah, now I am living the abundant life. He never lacked companionship until the day came when his money bags were empty. And that was very soon. He didn't know that hunting trips and bottles of wine and feasts and women all could cost so much. And he didn't have a penny in his pocket. He had no savings. And he had no family, no auntie to go to. To ask her if he could stay in her house overnight. And all his fair weather friends left him. On top of that, there was a recession in the land. It was a time of, of a fierce drought. There was dust everywhere. And wells went dry. And you paid for water to drink. And starvation through the land. And people were fleeing. And the boom turned to bust. The dream faded in that increasing dry heat. And his friends were no more. They all didn't want to know him because he had nothing to give them any longer. Could he fall further still? Yes, he could. As a Jew, he would have nothing to do with pigs. They were unclean animals. But the only job he could get now was caring for a herd of pigs in a field. And he was uh, so hungry that he desired, he desired, he longed to eat the food, the pods that the pigs were themselves eating. Sin, my friends, is a hard master. You leave my saviour. You go away from him, uh, and you will serve sin. And uh, he can oil the wheels a little bit, but very soon the oil goes, and there's a squeak and a groan and a pain in every step. He ate from the pig's own trough. He was like a party drinker who becomes a drunk. He was like a drug user who becomes an addict. He was like a promiscuous person who gets gonorrhea. The party has become a prison. And that's what sin does. If you give yourself to sin, then the wages of sin is death. You see the picture here then. You see the depths to which this boy fell. There's no redeeming feature about him at all. From the time he asks his father to give him the portion of his goods and he heads off for the distant country, he ends up in a field of pigs. Now, let's be careful about this. You, you understand. You must understand with me what I'm saying. I'm saying to you now that this is not an allegory of the sinner. This is not a type of every man who does not yet know God. And if I pursued that line, I would be saying to every man and woman and to middle-aged men and women of the utmost decorum and respectability, I would say, there you are with the pigs and prostitutes squandering all that a loving father has given to you. I am not saying that, and that is not the message of this chapter. This man is not every man. This boy is not your run-of-the-mill sinner. This man is how he is described in, in this parable of Jesus. He is a rake. This man is a fool. 
This man is a drunkard. He's a waster. He's a derelict. He is a heartbreaker. That is what he is. He doesn't stand before us in this parable as Mr. Everyman. He stands before us as a symbol of a man in the pits. As far as you can go, as low as you can fall. He's a man in the gutter, on the waterfront, on death row. He's the extreme. He is a man thrown out of low company. If there ever was a son who a father would refuse to have him enter <coughs> the home again, it would be this boy. If there ever was a man that God would reject, it would be this boy. He is the Gadarene demoniac. He is the Saul of Tarsus. He is David in bed with another man's wife and plotting the murder of her husband. He is the policeman who rapes and murders a girl walking home and buries her body. This man is on the lowest rung of the ladder. He's an inch above the surface of the cesspool and he is sinking. We think of the angels and they're watching this whole scene and they're saying to one another, is, is, is he the worst? Is he the worst yet? Is he? And they're debating. Um, was, was King Saul the worst? Was Saul of Tarsus the worst? Uh, is the prodigal son worse than anyone else? Will our Lord, our Lord receive this man? Surely not, they say to one another. It means, my friends, listen, it means for you that you could never say someone who is as bad as me can never hope to receive redemption and mercy and the glories of heaven from the Holy God. We can think we are unique. We can think, well, there's no hope for me. And yet, cure is a man, and it's the worst possible scenario that you will find describing him. The most abandoned, the most selfish, the most egotistical, the most carnal, the most fleshly, the cruelest of boys. And yet there is a road that goes from where he is to where our Heavenly Father is. Whatever we might be tonight, however cold there is in our hearts, and we've masqueraded and hidden that coldness and deadness, there's a way from where you are now to the living God, the loving God in heaven. So that's my first part on the state of this man. And now let's look at his repentance. <coughs> the theme that runs through the chapter is not that God rejoices in sinners. That's thought for the day stuff. It is that God rejoices in sinners repenting. That's its theme. It is there in verse 7, it is there in verse 10. So what is this word repentance? Three syllables, what does it mean? And the answer is found in this picture that you have in the parable that Jesus told of the prodigal son. What happened to him? Two, three things happened to him. Firstly, he came to his senses. Verse uh, 17 he came to himself. He came to himself. Do you see it? Those are the words. He saw what he'd done. He realized where his life was at the moment. He knew where he was at. He was far from home. He was penniless. He was homeless, hopeless, disgraced, discredited, abandoned. And he came to himself. I'm saying to you, this is not the typical sinner, but this is the worst sinner. 
Yet, isn't it true for all of us on our return to God that we've got to come to ourselves? We've got to face up to who we really are, to our condition. Maybe there are marks, and at times the curtain is pulled open for a moment and we, we see ourselves. We look in a mirror and we catch a glimpse of our inward state and condition. Maybe our sin is notorious and we come to see it. And that's, that's why this, this book is such a marvellous book. And this story is so terrific. You'd have thought that this boy would have been aware for months and months of what he had done. Looking back how he had stamped on his father's love and grabbed everything and turned his back and run away with joy in his heart that he'd broken his father's heart. We look at some people and, and we say, they must know the truth about themselves. That's what we say. They have to know the alcoholic. He must know. The pedophile must know. The drug addict is aware of what he's doing to his health. He realizes what he's doing to his family, to his wife, to his children and their shame at people bringing their father home half drunk in the night or lying in the gutter. Surely this man must know. He must come to his senses. But you go to the Old Testament, you find the marvelous story there of King David. And how he's taken another man's young wife. And he's impregnated her, and he's plotted the murder which he achieves of the man's, of the woman's husband. And the months go by, and he's oblivious to what he's done. <coughs> You'd think, ah, his conscience would trouble him, he'd be awakened, and he'd be groaning at all that he. The one who wrote Psalm 23 and those other psalms, the way that God had blessed him and raised him up and protected him from King Saul. You think he'd be broken hearted? It took a prophet sending a message to him, coming to him and telling him a story and saying, You are the man for David to come to himself and pray Psalm 51. <clears throat> he didn't know where he was. Remember our first father, Adam, how after he defied God and seized the forbidden fruit, the one thing God said, everything is yours, but in this time of probation, you, you, you don't touch the fruit in, in the garden. he took it and was immediately guilty. And what did he do? He hid. He came to himself. He hid behind the bushes from the Lord who came to visit him. And God says to him, Where are you? Adam, where are you? And God is saying to every one of you tonight, where are you now in relation to me, your creator, mm -hmm. the giver of every good and lovely thing you've ever had in your life? Where are you in relationship to me? There are many men and women in Kent. Their sin is staring them in the face. They haven't come to themselves. They haven't come to their senses. They're standing on the full court of eternity, on the threshold of an evaluation of their lives by Almighty God. And all they have are the baubles and bundles and beads, the toys of their materialism, the remnants of a wasted life, some property, some family, some money, some memories, and that's all. They have never come to themselves. 
vanity of vanities, all their lives a vanity. John Middle Milton, he tells well, of that moment when we think the prize is in our grasp and we finally got what we wanted in life then, he says, Come the blind furies with their abhorred shears, and they slit the thin spun line, and life is over. I don't want to sentimentalize, but you recall the great figures of the 20th century now. Um, Harold Wilson. Ronald Reagan, Winston Churchill, and you think of those mighty, influential, famous men, the last years of their lives. They had no remembrance at all of what they had achieved, of the office they held, or how they rubbed shoulders with all the greatest people in the world, that their faces appeared on coins and stamps and they were honoured by the applause of millions. All those ego-reinforcing <coughs> achievements. And yet in their final years, they weren't aware. It was just dust that slipped out of their hands. And I say, when a sinner comes to his senses, he comes out of the shadow lands that he's been living. He comes to see in the light of God himself and his past and his future. And he comes to himself. Then uh, he remembered his father. The word father is mentioned then once in the parable so far, but in the next verses or six times it is mentioned. You see, it is important for this reason. The shorter catechism tells us when it defines what repentance is, that it starts with an apprehension of the mercy of God. That's what repentance is. You think I'm making a mess of my life. I'm sinning against heaven. I'm sinning against God. But God can be merciful. Even to me. God can smile. God can forgive. God can pardon my sins. He can. He's a merciful God. Men will never repent unless they have hope. It might be a glimmer. It might be just, if only, maybe, um, it's an encouragement. Come now, try this. Come, come and uh, reach out a hand to God. Take a step, just a little step, a baby step to, towards God. Come. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. What an encouragement for you to come from where you are to this welcoming Jesus. Sinners, Jesus will receive the sound the word of grace to all who the heavenly pathway leave, all who linger, all who fall, sing it o'er and o'er again. Christ receiveth sinful men. Make the message clear and plain, Christ receiveth sinful men. I don't care who you are or what you've been, where you spent last night, doesn't matter. If you come with an atom of repentance, and you bring that repentance in all its imperfection and smallness and you 
you give it to Jesus Christ, he will in no wise cast you out. There's a glimmer. There's a glimmer. There was implanted indelibly in this man's consciousness that when things went wrong, when things went badly wrong, he could always go home. He hadn't been taught, if you bring disgrace on the family, don't think of coming back. You, you can always go home, he was taught. And he saw this truth lived out by the patience and kindness and the tears of his father. However low you go, however deep the abyss into which you fall, however appalling the degradation, you must always feel, son, this is your home. And you can always come back to it. I would beg and plead with all the parents here that they give their children the same absolute certainty. That if they face the ultimate in tragedy, they can always come home. If they become drunkards, they can come home. If they marry the wrong people, they can come home. If they get a sexually transmitted disease, they can come home. If they get pregnant, they can come home. If they have an abortion, they can come home. If they end up in jail, they can come home. They must, they need that assurance. It's one of the basic elements of divine pedagogy. That is how God trains his children. He wants them to exemplify and manifest his own fatherhood. How he is, we must be. And he had that security in the distant city. With all its wretched memories, where can he go? He thought one day, I can go home. The only people who can't go home are the people who are determined to change it and make it an anti-Christ home and feed their evil propaganda from their home sustained by their father and mother who love the Lord. You can't do that. You're not welcome to do that. But if you have some repentance, you can go home. And this boy saw it. If you turn from the lust of the flesh, from the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, you can go home. You can go home to God. And then repentance is uh, not perfection. He, he returned with... Uh, a rehearsal of what he would say. How, how shall I approach that? What shall I say to that? I, mean, I, I have sinned uh, against heaven and in your sight, and I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. So that uh, when harvest time came, and he stood with the other men in the marketplace early in the morning, for his father's foreman to come and choose a, a dozen men to work for him, that um, he would choose him. He would make him to be one of his hired servants. The boy could believe in his father's grace, but he didn't see how great it was. And so he thought he could soften his father by a, a, a sentence that he rehearsed all the journey home. Of course, his father cut down his speech halfway through it and smothered him in his house. In other words, you don't have to be spotlessly correct in your theology, in your ethics, in anything 
you come to God just as you are, with the smell of the pig still on you. You come to this God, high and holy, in his perfection, high and holy, in his mercy and in his love. And you, just as you are, come to him just as he is. <coughs> and that's what repentance is. And then thirdly, lastly, the uh, return of the Son. The return, what ours can you use? Reconciliation. Um, renewal. He turns the corner of the, <coughs> the country lane and there, there's that white watch cottage, the thatch door. And he pauses and he looks down and can he go and face the father he has <coughs> so defiled and hurt, so deeply. And he pauses. And his father had often gone to the window and he looked up hoping one day he would see a figure he knew and loved and one day he sees him there and he runs to the kitchen door and he opens it and he runs across to the farmyard and he opens the gate and he goes up the path to this boy in case the boy would change his mind old legs running be careful old man be careful now and he runs and runs and the boy is looking at him and he comes to him and he wraps his arms around him and he kisses him and he weeps over him. The boy so thin, <coughs> so bedraggled, so wretched, so undernourished, smelling of the pigs, shame and fear all over his face. And he runs to him and he wraps his arms around him and he says, I'll never let you go again. I'll never let you go. That's what he says to him. And the surprise servants come running up behind them and he sees them come in. He says, get the best robe. It's in the bedroom, in, in the wardrobe. You'll see it there. Bring that here. And the, the slippers, they're there at the bottom of the wardrobe. Bring that too. And there's the ring. And that's in a box. It's so on this chest of drawers, open it, you'll see the ring there, and bring that ring with you, and then uh, you go and slaughter the fatted calf. We're having a feast. That's what he said. He didn't say, what do you want? He didn't say that. Who do you think you are, coming back? What a shape you're in. How have you got into such a mess? He doesn't say, don't you know what disgrace you brought upon us? Do you know how worried your mother has been? You never sent us a letter. You never kept contact with us at all. Do you never think of getting in touch? None of that at all. And soon there's the smell of roast veal in the air and the musicians are tuning their, their guitars and their banjos and their bagpipes. And the women are putting on their best dresses and they're carrying out the tables and the chairs and there's dancing because this boy was dead he's alive he was lost he's been found and everything is forgotten in the joy of restoration it's resurrection day on the farm and they began to celebrate now, you see this picture that Jesus told. He's telling us about God. The Father of all who turn to him and believe in him. That's what he's telling us. He's telling us of the joy in God. When you turn from your unbelief and your sin and repent of it and come to him. He tells of a God who smiles and smiles forever on us, however bad we've been. 
the chief of sin. I'm sure that if I would have begun uh, with some words of apology, you know uh, what I did. I'm so sorry about it. Um, don't you want to discuss my shame? We do the same, don't we? The devil turns us back to how we've lived and what we've done and what a mess we've made of things and the people who loved us that we've hurt so much. Past is past. God buries it. He buries it in the deepest sea. We can't reach it. We can't live at that depth. It's, God has just cast it away from him. And we, we are made sons and we would say, well, okay, first five years as a servant, you live above the barn and you work. You learn your spurs for five years. And then we'll have a, a meeting. Your older brother and me and, and, and your mother and we talk about it. It's nothing like that. Immediately, the best one. The sandals of sonship on his feet. The ring is on his finger. The joy, the celebration. Everything in heaven is made over to us when, when we come to God. All our sins are forgiven. All our past sins. All our present sins, all our future sins, they're all forgiven. God begins immediately to work all things together for our good. God immediately begins to supply all our needs. Now God says he'll never leave us. When we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he's there for us. He tells us. This man who had walked home all the way, saying to himself, he'll hire me at harvest time, perhaps. And he's made an heir of salvation. The purchase of blood, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is his story. What a story. This is his song. What a song he has to sing. He speaks to God. May give him with the, the Holy Spirit. Imagine. Imagine when the sewers of London get clogged with wipes. And there's a ton of stinking stuff there and it's clogging the sewers. We don't say to Her Majesty. Um, put your galoshes on and your sour western and this yellow raincoat and come and here's a shovel and come and work and clear the sewers. We don't think like that, do we? It's honourable, necessary work, but we have too much respect. But God, the Holy Spirit, he comes into our hearts that are evil above all things and desperately wicked. The stink of every sin is there. And he comes. <coughs> he comes into our life. He lives in us. And he wars against every weakness. And he strengthens us. In our whole work. In our whole future. And he never leaves us. He seals us. He is the seal for our redemption. The boy came to himself. Yeah. Then he made his decision that he would go back to his father. Yes. No person ever became a Christian without making a decision. I want each one of you to make a decision tonight. Every one of you, however old, however young you might be. I want you to say, I am going to my father. 
I'm going to know God as my Father. I'm going to Him tonight. The prodigal son was transformed and his recovery was assured when he came to himself. When he determined that he would go home to his father and when he made the journey Some of you stop after the first step and you say, um, yeah, I've come to myself and I'm, I'm in a mess. And you stop there. Not enough. Don't stop there. And you will say to yourself, I will go to my father. But then you say, but not yet. Don't do that. Don't stop there. You, you come. Him that comes to me. There's no way. <laughs> In no wise will I cast him out. He come to a welcoming Saviour who promise, promises you rest. If you come. Where where have some of you stopped? Where have you stopped? You know, it's not enough to have all the knowledge of the Bible that you think people like me have. No good. I have no hope in that. All the conviction of sin in the world really hurt. Hurting at sin. Don't stop there. It's not enough. You've got to come home. You've got to go to my father's home. You've got to come. Come with me. Come with us here, poor Christians. We'll do you good. Come with us now. Hold hands with us. And we'll all go. We'll all go home. To our father. To the open arms. Now to there. To welcome. To the smile. To the delight. <laughs> Son, you've come home. If you ask me what saved this boy, I would say to you, well, he was saved by the abundant love of his father. That's a good answer, isn't it? If you would ask me what saved this boy, I would say he went on a journey. He went on a journey home. That's what I would say. And it's always both of those. This, they've got to be. You've got to have them both. Uh, I want you to make a journey from where you are tonight to, to where God is present with us. He's looking down upon us. Jesus is moving now in our midst and he's nudging us and he's saying, yes, he's speaking to you and he's talking to you tonight. That's why he's brought me here to bring this message that you know so well. But to say it in a fresh way, in a new way, and touch the hearts of all of you young and old. That's why I'm coming. And that's why you come. And that's why Jesus is with us. And he's speaking to us. It's not enough to say, Are you washed in the blood of our Lord? It's a fountain. Plunge into it. Not difficult to jump in. Jump in. Jump in. Come to Him. Let's come to ourselves. Let's see the mercy of God. Let's make up our mind. We're going to our Father's house. No more delays then, okay? No more delays. No more excuses. No more saying, well, I, I want to taste the world first. Ah, don't, don't. You may be no nearer to God and his salvation this moment than you will ever be again. So, when you make a decision, tonight I'm, I'm going to come just as I am, 
with my little cake. So this wonderful, warm, embracing Saviour, whose arms are stretched out to receive you, he's going to run to you. He's going to meet you not halfway, but 99% of the way he's going.